a little girl sitting in the classroom. I always thought that I was stupid, that I wasn't good enough, and that I didn't fit in. Today, my story is about my childhood, in the sense that it was really limited, that um, I couldn't have grown as I could have as had someone known about my diversity. Th um, do you have shadows in your past? I feel as if we all do. My shadows were wrapped up in shame, a lifetime of shame, of feeling that I didn't fit in, and I was unworthy, and that I didn't belong. The oldest of five um, lived in a tough housing estate in the east end of Glasgow, where crime and poverty and violence were a part of everyday life. My mum done her best to bring us up as a single parent family. My dad was an alcoholic with severe mental health issues, but despite my childhood conditions, I felt that I was failed by the education system. I felt that I didn't fit in and that I was stupid. So my connection to neurodiversity is that I had undiagnosed dyslexia until I was 26 years old. By that time, I had already had a lifetime of embarrassment and humiliation about feeling that I didn't fit in. Now, neurodiversity, um, if someone would have told me way back then, when I was a little girl, that I was neurodiverse, I would have thought that I had to go in an ambulance to the accident emergency. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> so essentially, neurodiversity means that we're just wired differently. Our brain thinks differently. Um, neurodiversity covers a wide range of topics, but which I am by no means an expert in talking about. I've only got some lived experience of being dyslexic. So neurodiversity covers ADHD, autism, Asperger's, dyscalculia, dyslexia, just to mention a few. So, a lifetime of feeling that I didn't belong and I didn't fit in and that I was stupid. So, life really could have went either way for me. My primary, my primary school was, wasn't so bad. I was really creative. I was a chess champion. I played all the musical instruments. As I got to high school, though, I became a really product of my environment. I disengaged with my, my education in secondary school. I experimented with drugs and alcohol, and I'd done anything that was going to make me escape from the classroom. Thankfully, um, I, I escaped a criminal record as well. Um, so a school dropout, a teenage mum leaving school with no qualifications and feeling stupid. I entered into the workplace already feeling that I'd lost my sense of identity, that I was stupid and that it didn't fit in. So my message today is really about the impact that education can have on a young person if they feel that they're not good enough. And the way that we measure intelligence and success really has to change. Dyslexia, so what is dyslexia? Well, in a really basic level, dyslexia um, is a, and a problem with phonological awareness. How we process language and words, there's a lot more to it than that, but I've not got time to get into today. Dyslexia is a brain-based condition we're left and we're right side of the brain. That's we're conscious and we're non-conscious mind. So we're left side of the, the, the brain is thought that processes languages and words um, and the right side more spatial activities, uh, pictures. So it's thought that the dyslexic person, if you're a neurotypical person, right, a normal person, whatever that is, you would go in in a travel capacity to your car and you would drive from A to B on the motorway straight there. A dyslexic person will jump in the car and they'll take the scenic route. They might get there, <laughs> but it'll just take a lot longer to get there. And we'll see many amazing things along the way. <laughs> so dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence. How we measure intelligence. I was a chess champion in my primary school, right? That didn't go on to my, my secondary school, however. Um, I totally did become aware, um, a part of my environment. My poverty consciousness, I wasn't aware of that at the time. You know, 40% of millionaires are self-made, 40% uh, of dyslexics are self-made millionaires. Like, d I didn't even know that. So I suppose my message today is just that our, our childhood, it didn't allow me to grow in the way in which it could have. We all have limiting beliefs as adults. And I believe that sometimes if we're having an identity crisis about, you know, being neurodiverse, that can hinder our creative abilities. 
So, now here I am. As a dyslexic standing on this stage, I have these little notes because if I forgot what I was going to say to you, I'd run off the stage, right? That is a problem, memorising information. Like the education system today, it teaches us, doesn't it, to memorise information, to pass exams. That certainly isn't my forte. However, um, standing here, I can't even spell dyslexia. Every time, who made that word up, right? They do it on purpose. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I can laugh about it now, but it made me cry, like, so wrapped up in shame. I never, this is actually only the first time I've ever spoke about being dyslexic in a public, in a public place. So, <laughs> because it was so wrapped up in shame. And even though um, I know it's stupid, 10% of, of people are dyslexic in this world, and that's only people that's identified as being dyslexic. One in seven people are neurodiverse, and you know, there's a lot more than that, I can tell you. Neuroplasticity, our ability in our minds to, to make new connections and rewire our brain, it's one of our greatest assets. I really do believe that we can evolve. You know, I'm very interested in neuroscience and how our brain works, especially because someone told me that minds didn't work, and I was stupid. Um, anyway, the neurodiversity is the new buzzword. Um, my sister's in the audience and she was saying, that's a new buzzword in IT technology. You know, what does that mean? What does neurodiversity mean? It just essentially means that we think differently. It's so important. Um, in the digital age, we're in the new industrial revolution. The, the skills that we need for the future isn't going to be the skills that we had from the past and the jobs that we need. We need neurotypical minds and new, uh, cognitive diversity has to be a priority. Examples from some workplace, um, as um, it was said that I'm in the military, I was looking at the Israeli army. They actually actively recruit autistic soldiers to be in their intelligence corps. Soldiers who would otherwise be exempt from military service, but they understand that their heightened perceptual skills are actually an asset for what we need for the future. Um, the second sea lord, the highest, second highest ranking officer in the Navy, he spoke out this year about his autistic strengths and how it has got him to the most senior position he is in the Royal Navy. Um, another example, um, the Government Communication Agency, the British Cyber Communication Agency, actively recruits dyslexic people because they understand the value in their thinking and how we have to look at problems and patterns differently as we look to the future, to what jobs we're going to need. So dyslexic thinkers have actually changed the world. Who's got an iPhone? Right, Steve Jobs, so he's a dyslexic person. Um, Richard Branson's taking people to space. If you Google dyslexic thinkers, never mind all the other neurodiverse conditions, have actually changed the world. Albert Einstein, but no one told me that. Well, I didn't really know that. Scientists, actors, the list is endless of dyslexic thinkers. Brain science is really helping us see how much neurodiversity is so important in this world. However, how inclusive does the world feel to those round about us who are neurodiverse and who feel that they don't fit in? I believe that if you, you know, there's a whole question around, you know, rubber stamping a neurodiverse condition and giving people labels. But we need to, you know, if you feel that you're not, you're stupid and you learn differently, we need to talk about that and learn, you know, from that. Um, that really affects our identity. You know, I don't like labels, and that's the whole reason why I'm nearly 40 and before I'm speaking about it now. Um, we need to be, be um, people are scared. People are scared to tell their employers they are dyslexic, right? 70% of people hide from their employer that are dyslexic. That's nothing to do with any of the other conditions either. So you imagine that, and I've been there. I was scared about it. I was so wrapped up in shame. Even when I found out when I was 26, 14 years ago, I was so scared to talk about it. I could tell my close family and friends, but I didn't want people to think I was stupid because it was so wrapped up in my own shame of feeling that I was stupid um, and unworthy of belonging. So how we measure success and intelligence really needs to change. As a society, we need to evolve as people are evolving. We need to acknowledge and give people the space to flourish with their creation and their innovative ideas and their thinking. In the digital age, is a new revolution. This is what we are. We need skills for the future. 
I believe if the world was full of neurotypical people, it would be full of lawyers and bankers, right? And I'm sorry if any of are, but we wouldn't want the same as that, would we? We're all so diverse, even neurotypical people. Everyone's so different. The language that we use for the words dyslexia, that's in ancient Greece, like dys meaning absence and lexia meaning language. Absence of language. The language of that needs to go, we need a new word. I've not got one right here, but I'll think about it. Um, it needs to be learning difference. We all learn really differently. If someone would have told me at school, you learn differently, that you know that would have totally changed my life to thinking that I was stupid. Um, the labels we give people in society, and that's one of the reasons I was thinking about this. I don't like labels. I don't want to make excuses for things. Labels are just, for me, in a really basic level, like signposts in a street. It will tell you the name of the street, but does it tell you how many houses are in the street? Does it tell you how many people stay in the houses? We need to truly drop the labels from our mind. Yes, be curious about it. So my ask of you today is to be curious the next time. You, you, you probably know someone in your family or friends who's neurodiverse and ask them about their condition, but also drop the label from it for you to truly understand the subject. So here I am now, looking forward to the future. Despite my learning challenges, I feel that I've really done amazing in my life. You know, things could have went either way. Um, I currently live a transformed life than what I did when I was younger. Um, I'm a mum, a role model mum, so she tells me. <laughs> um, my, daughter <laughs> my daughter and I are uh, university graduates. <laughs> my sister might tell you had, she had two degrees because she was proofreading some of my work when I was at university, but that's... <laughs> so um, I'm a sergeant in the British Army. Uh, I'm a reservist and um, I've done it for the past 14 years. I teach people about inclusive leadership and empower people to be the best version of themselves. I'm in the Defence Mindfulness Steering Group. I'm in Neurodiversity Networks. I'm talking about it now. I'm inspiring people to be the best versions of themselves. I have returned to education where I'm a youth impact life coach and I'm teaching young people about values-based leadership, about what success is and what intelligence is. Um, and that not everyone, you know, the psychological effects of putting square pegs in round holes is no longer acceptable. It outweighs the benefits, you know, if we don't fit in. <laughs> not allowing differences is essentially destroying value. We've got to really get on board with this. We all have a family or friend, so I invite you to be curious the next time that you hear about this. Not supporting people who have neurodiverse conditions results in a loss of talent for our future world and our workforce, we have a very talented world and we're all very, very unique. Um, when not diagnosed with these conditions or people that people don't know about it, it essentially destroys value and people disengage from their identity. Respecting neurodiversity means challenging assumptions about what intelligence is and success is and how we actually measure it. So I believe that the education system, you know, teachers need a new name, leaders of learning, and we need to know about all the different learning styles and not just the traditional ones about how we measure intelligence and success. There, we have many impact, you know, have many minutes in a day to make an impact in the world. Imagine a world, there's eight billion people where everyone was curious about, you know, that were creative gifts that we all have. Um, <laughs> so I believe that if, a world, if we had a world full of, um, no, oh, neurotyp, this is what as I was forgetting what I was going to say, I'm in line. Neurotypical people are made for the classroom and neurodiverse people are made for the world. That's what I'm feeling it right now and it is really different. So I'll leave you li with a little quote that I've seen on Twitter because it's certainly not mine. Um, great minds do not think alike. <laughs>